Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I tell you, it, uh, I hope you had a good end of the summer. Um, it, this feels, I'm, I know for us on the Hill, you know, we started a little bit later back. It does feel like a bit of a first week at school uh, again uh, as we get back into session. And, you know, just as, you know, or maybe the new TV season, and with any good TV session, I'm making up this analogy as I go, you know, if we're starting with a rerun, um, maybe to get everybody back up to speed, we are clearly starting with a rerun as we see the House Republican leadership once again go on a what appears to be a potential kamikaze drive in terms of government funding and threatening once again a potential government shutdown, which would have, as I've said time and time again, a more draconian effect on Virginia and Virginians than any other state uh, in the nation. Uh, it, it would be the height of irresponsibility. Um, the approach that the speaker put out at first of a so-called continuing resolution, CR until, until March, uh, which had, would be, again, Democrats and Republicans alike have said makes no sense, a CR that undermines the military, a continuing resolution that literally uh, would have veterans uh, across the country be hit uh, disproportionately hard because the, the, uh, some of the new veterans legislation, more veterans have taken it up than was initially anticipated. They're going to run out of money even earlier than other um, agencies. And then if that wasn't bad enough, They've saddled on again a a, a right wing right wing extremist bill uh, that um, would basically reiterate what is already law that if you're foreign national you don't vote in elections in America that is the law of the land but the uh, kind of crazy bill that was put up um, would have even said that um, you know to prove citizenship. You know, if you happen to be a spouse that changed your name during, uh, with getting married, uh, you'd have to go back and go through a whole uh, process again. Uh, the good news, I guess, is is that that um, more reasonable heads on the Republican side said that was a crazy approach. Um, but as we are now 19 days away from government shutdown, uh, we will go through the Kabuki theater one more time of some other proposal maybe bubbling up next week, when at the end of the day what we ought to do is adhere to the agreed upon totals that the Speaker himself agreed upon, um, although he, he did agree on some of those, deal with some of the what's called anomalies, which are events, whether they are uh, disaster relief or the veterans program that's run out of funding or making sure our military, uh, and I think about you know, ship repair or uh, other reasons, are, are dealt with and do the no normal funding till the middle of December and we would then have another end of the year battle but the uh, the notion uh, that of this crazy approach now coming with the end of the fiscal year September 30th is um, uh, even the House Republicans have agreed that the speaker's plan was um, inadequate on a host of levels so stay tuned but if you feel like you've seen this show before and it's a rerun you're right uh, end of the day on this issue, again, no state in the country is more disproportionately hit than Virginia with a government shutdown, with the number of our federal employees, with the number of our government contractors, with the number of our military installations. It would be a disaster for Virginia uh, and again, I think we will avoid it, but it's, um, it's a little sad that we have to go through this whole process uh, one more time. Second issue is, is one that um, I've been talking about for a long time, and that is whether we put any guardrails on social media. Um, I think you know, our failure, although we recently passed the Kids Online Safety Act, at least in the Senate, we still need to pass it in the House, um, but it is still wreaking havoc. Um, I think if we can look at the level of mental health incidents uh, amongst our kids across the country, across all economic, racial, geographic areas. A lot of this can be traced back to 2012 as these online platforms 
came on, um, and it, it's still an enormous challenge. Uh, the specific issue I want to raise is a, a tragedy that happened to one of our military families in Virginia, where the Discord platform, one of the many that are out there that don't have the same visibility, for example, of, of Facebook or uh, YouTube or others, but the uh, this Discord platform is a nest of misinformation, disinformation, and particularly, you know, a site that encourages young people to do self-harm. There was a uh, Virginia family, uh, their daughter was literally encouraged on some of these platforms on Discord to do self-harm and even uh, attempted uh, suicide. It was a tragedy. My staff has met with the family. Um, we you know, asked Discord to change a series of its procedures. We have received a response. Uh, what's written on the response uh, looks like positive movement, um, but we have to uh, you know, trust but verify. We are going to continue to monitor whether the Discord leadership makes the changes they've committed to. Um, but the fact that we still don't have a comprehensive approach is, is a great concern to me. We took at least a step forward with the Kids Online Safety Bill that passed with close to 90 votes in the Senate, I think maybe even a few more. Um, that's a good first step, but this is a problem that's not going away. Uh, not to go down a total different rabbit hole on this, but um, some of you may have seen uh, the fact that France uh, elect, or arrested uh, the head of Telegram, another area where drug sales, terrorist groups, others are both financed, exchange information, a real cesspool. Um, but I hope that is, and we have to be concerned obviously about First Amendment, but the fact that uh, some of these companies ignore any kind of governmental jurisdiction, um, you know, France taking a shot across the bow holding potentially a CEO liable. I'm not saying that ought to happen here in America, but I do say there's got to be some level of accountability. and. I would come back again to the fact that I've got about eight different bipartisan bills that go from Section 230 reform to data portability and interoperability to, uh, to dark patterns. You won't have to hear the whole, the whole lecture here again. Um, but this is an issue that is not going to go away. And we owe it to our kids. We owe it to security in our elections, where we'll be having some of the social media platforms in next Wednesday, Wednesday before the Intelligence Committee, which, by the way, this will be the only open hearing this election cycle from any committee, House or Senate, and if anyone thinks that the, um, the Russians or Iranians or others have gone away, I would simply point to the recent Justice Department indictment uh, of a RT and Russian entities working with a, a group, um, frankly, Canadians based in Tennessee that were spreading this disinformation and misinformation about the elections. And, we will talk about that and other issues of concern. We've got to make sure people are aware. We have enough divisions in America uh, that Americans ought to be sorting out, and our elections not a ha not, ought to not have um, undue influence uh, by foreign governments. Final issue, I know we've got to get to the questions. Uh, I'm proud, Tim Kaine and I are proud to pick up uh, legislation that Jennifer McClellan has already gotten through the House, which would rename the um, Petersburg Post Office after John Mercer Langston, uh, African-American member who was the, literally the first African-American member of Congress from Virginia, um, is someone who served as a soldier, somebody who served uh, as an elected official, and someone who deserves that kind of recognition uh, and look forward to carrying that legislation, Tim and I, through to conclusion so that the, uh, uh, the post office in Petersburg can be renamed appropriately. Um, I know I've gone a little bit longer than normal. Uh, my first swing back as well with you guys, uh, uh, Virginia Press, since, since the session has restarted. Although I will be seeing many of you, I hope, um, over the next three or four days. I'm going to be in Richmond. I'm going to be all across Southside, Farmville, Danville, Martinsville, uh, Roanoke, Montgomery County. Uh, so if you don't get what you got need from me here, I you know, hope I get to see you on the road. Laura, why don't I turn it back over to you and we can get started. Senator, our first question is J.J. Green with WTOP. 
Senator, thank you for the chance to ask you this. A uh, couple questions, uh, especially related to the uh, Russia meddling uh, interference cyber activity. A little over seven years ago, after the 2016 presidential election, U.S. intelligence discovered a massive Russian Kremlin effort to interfere with the election. We spoke then, and you said Moscow would likely try this again, but it might be worse if U.S. systems weren't hardened. So with the indictments and sanctions that you mentioned by DOJ and, of course, the State Department, first question is, how do you assess this alleged attack by Russia in, in view of what you've seen with that? Well, first of all, what we saw coming out of 2016, where there was a massive effort that caught, frankly, our law enforcement and intelligence community off guard, we've made improvements. The, the remarkable thing is you know, the Trump intelligence agency leaderships and the FBI leadership, you know, we had one of the cleanest elections around in 2020 uh, because there was that focus. Um, you know, frankly, when somebody like Chris Krebs at CISA, you know, and, and I, when I think about election security, I think about hardening of the infrastructure around our election system itself and then the misinformation, disinformation. Um, we called out a lot of that activity in, in 2020, misinformation, disinformation, you know, and again, it was the Iranians, for example, that had a very specific effort to try to associate Trump with Proud Boys. Uh, Chris Krebs did a good job on uh, the, the infrastructure around our election system. Now, him doing that and saying it was a safe election cost him his job as Mr. Trump then fired him. Um, you know, as we go to 2024, a, you know, we are, I think, well prepared. Uh, that's the good news. Uh, we have the election infrastructure. I was just with the current head of CISA, Jen Easterly, last week. I think we've made great improvements. Um, I think on the on the misinformation, disinformation, we are you know, we've made progress, but there's challenges. One, there's the willingness of Americans to believe crazy theories just because they read it on the internet. We even see presidential candidates uh, spouting off crazy theories that have no basis in fact. We've got artificial intelligence tools that can be used as deep fakes and manipulating images and voices. We've seen a little of that. I'm actually surprised we've not, we've not seen more. Um, we had a six-month period where there was no communication between uh, social media companies and the government. Uh, that's stopped because a, a case, thank goodness, the Supreme Court struck down about voluntary communication. Um, but and we've had these actions by the Russians, but we've seen other nation states, Iran, China, Russia, and others realize that it is cheap and easy to try to put out misinformation uh, in an internet-connected world. A lot cheaper to spread false stories than it is to buy a tank or a truck. Um, so we've got to be on guard. I do worry that the closer we get to the election, the more possibility of Russia or Iran or other nation states trying to spread, you know, more false information uh, because, you know, we start voting in just a few weeks. And um, I am enormously concerned. And I, I feel like the level of kind of public attention to this issue has dissipated a little bit. That's one of the goals we have in our hearing next week to kind of, again, re-alert the public that, don't just believe everything because you read it on the Internet and to make sure if you see something uh, or hear something, particularly about voting itself, that you contact your election officials. There's ways we can protect ourselves, and uh, part of that is better public education. Senator, our one, next one. question. Sure. I'm sorry, we have to move on to our next question. We have quite a few in the queue today. Okay. Our next question is Avery Davis with 29 News. Hello, Senator. Thank you for speaking to us today. Um, we have become aware that there are continuing issues in central Virginia as far as people receiving mail goes. And I know that you've been um, outspoken about this issue in the past. And I Avery, know that we're Avery, here today to discuss hold them. Avery, I, I just want to make sure I, I didn't hear you that one about are we talking about mail again? Yes, sir. We're okay. talking about USPS. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering if you have any updates um, as far as your plans uh, to, to help combat this or what you think needs to be done. You know, this is, there are, uh, there are certain issues, unfortunately, that seem to be uh, 
uh, that you never get fully fixed. Um, and, um, you know, trying to make sure that we return to a world-class mail delivery system is, is one. Um, let me take this in two chunks. On the kind of more widespread concerns across most of the Commonwealth, when the Postal Service put what was supposed to be reform in place a number of months back, and Virginia was the, uh, in effect, guinea pig coming out of the box, and we saw mail delivery rates drop to the 60% levels in, in some communities, uh, totally unacceptable. Um, the delegation, uh, in a bipartisan basis, has met with Postmaster DeJoy repeatedly, um, as recently as about six or seven weeks ago, and we are getting another meeting scheduled. And you know, we had that kind of dramatic fall off. There is great improvement, uh, as recently kind of region-wide, more kind of Richmond-focused now than Charlottesville, we were back up to like plus 95%. Now summer is easier than fall, and we've got ballots being taken out, so we've got to stay laser-focused on this. And we will have another session with the, uh, uh, the postmaster and his team, you know, very shortly. We are, we are on this, again, bipartisan, full delegation. Um, that is on the systemic issue of, across the Commonwealth. Charlottesville alone um, is, is a harder nut to crack because we, a couple things. We've had challenges a, num, a number of years, a couple years back when we first started this on shortages at the, in the Charlottesville market. Um, I'm often made the, uh, the comment that you know, sometimes Chick-fil-A starts people at a higher rate than the Postal Service. Now, you spend time at the post office, your income does go up, you've got great benefits, but for that, those entry-level positions, I've been lobbying for some time uh, to try to see if we could make Charlottesville, because of the tight labor market, a, a, a little bump up in pay. Um, I've still got work to do. We've been turned down twice on that. I'm going to go back again. I th my understanding, though, of the most recent um, uh, uh, problems in the Charlottesville community. We've never been able to get the post office back up uh, to f its full complement, and we've had to surge other folks in, like during the holiday season. But the fact that this was taking place during, you know, late summer, which is usually a low, a low period, I do think specifically, uh, at least the postal service has said, you know, a few people, you know, quit or retired during the summer, and they had they had vacations, um, you know. They say this will self-correct. We've seen some numbers tick up a little bit, but um, that doesn't do you much, give you much solace if you're waiting on mail or it's not been delivered or you, you're sending your bill in and, and you get a late charge. So we're going to stay on this. Um, Charlottesville, I think the long term, longer term solution is we got to bump that opening pay up and the Postal Service has that ability to do it so that particularly in terms of entry-level jobs, we get people into the system. Um, the, the current summer problem, though, is a reflection of that lower workforce than something that was systemic in some of the earlier problems we saw in Charlottesville a couple of years ago. We've seen some improvements in terms of the local postmaster, and, but it also, also ties into this overall regional problem where I do think, again, we've seen some improvement. Senator, our next question is Mitchell Miller with WTOP. Hi, Senator. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I had a follow-up question in connection with um, the elections. Mm -hmm. The secretaries of state from several states were on the Hill, as you probably are aware, yesterday, and some of them said that they are still, because of misinformation and rumors related to fraud, uh, that they are personally and their staff members are getting threats. I wonder how concerned you are about that. And also, related to the mail more generally, uh, the nation's uh, Association of Secretaries of State sent a letter to the post office saying that they're concerned about um, those mail-in ballots and that type of thing uh, nationwide. I wonder if you might be able to address those two issues. Yeah, let me do it in reverse order. Um, one of the things that we have pressed Postmaster General DeJoy on repeatedly, that we cannot have any screw-ups this election season. And you know, I'm again going to trust but verify, I think he understands that. And 
again, not to get into the weeds, but you know, mailing out ballots, ballots returned, you know, that's got to be treated like first-class priority mail. Uh, I believe that will be the case, um, and we are going to monitor this literally on a weekly basis. In terms of the disinformation, sometimes coming from you know, the Republican presidential candidate himself about the security of our elections or about the sanctity of mail-in ballots and absentee ballots uh, is a real problem. And you know, I think probably all of us have known an election worker at some point or another, usually you know, folks who've been very active in the community, usually folks that are seniors that do it out of a, a commitment to community and country. The fact that they're taking the level of abuse that they are is reprehensible. Um, I think those who interfere in the process, those who uh, abuse our election officials, ought to be pursued to the full extent of the law. And I'm going to be following this very closely in Virginia and, and see examples, you know, trying to make sure we get law enforcement involved um, because you know, you got a right to have your opinion, you got a right to vote for whoever you want. Um, you don't have a right to threaten or intimidate. Uh, people who provide what I think is you know, the most, the kind of epitome of public service. These folks don't do it for money. Uh, they do it because they believe in community, they believe in our democracy, and when you underline, undermine that trust and when you then, that undermining goes to the level of threats, you got to be held accountable. Senator, our next question is Bill Fitzgerald with WTVR. Uh, thanks, Senator, for taking, taking this call. Uh, you partially answered that, I think. It's, uh, it's more direct about the mail-in ballots and the concern of those election uh, commissioners, especially the Virginia one. Would you recommend that voters in Virginia do everything they can to physically get to the poll rather than trust that they're not going to, as you say, uh, screw up? Now, I think you know, if you're going to use mail-in, and I think it is safe and secure, do it early. What you can't wait is till that last three or four days before the election or, um, you know, post-market on the last day. Uh, you got to be, um, I think, be willing to go ahead and, and vote a little bit early uh, if you're going to do it by absentee. And thank goodness in Virginia, we still have early voting. Uh, it starts earlier. It starts I should have that date in my mind right now, but it's, it, we're one of the earliest states to start. Thank goodness the legislature and the former governor uh, put that law in place. Um, so it doesn't mean you got to wait till Election Day. It does mean, you know, there will be, uh, uh, an, I know I vote early, usually at, at um, City Hall in Alexandria. Um, Rachel's quickly trying to get... September 20th. September 20th uh, is when early voting starts in, in Virginia. But there will be, you know, we've got this in a tiered season where usually you have one site open and then you get closer elections, there are other sites open and Saturday voting. You know, we've made it easy to vote in Virginia. And I think that is a good thing. I think when we have more people participate in our democracy, uh, regardless of who wins, that's a good sign. Um, but I would know. I would not discourage people from voting by mail. I would simply say if you're going to vote by mail, get it in early. Senator, our next question is Mike Gooding with 13 News Now. Hi there, Senator. Thanks a lot. I want to talk to get back to the CR and possible shutdown. A year ago, you and I were on the back banks of the Elizabeth River, and you were there with all the Virginia Ship Repair Association guys. I wonder if you could just talk about what this yearly uncertainty does to those people. Well, Mike, you know, as somebody, I think I may have crossed over that I've been in politics longer than business, but I got to, I spent a lot of time in business. You know, the American government is one of the largest enterprises in the world. And business leaders, uh, regardless of their political affiliation, can pretty much live with anything as long as you give them a set of rules and abide by it, as long as you've got some level of predictability. When you add this continuing resolution process or stopgap funding measures, you, what you do is your ability to predict um, you know, when you're going to get that next ship into repair gets totally screwed up. You know, if you realize how much money of taxpayer money is wasted every year because of this stop and starts, 
uh, some of the people who uh, say so lightly, shut it down. And I guess I'd have to include Donald Trump, who's been saying recently, shut it down, shut it down. Um, I guess that comes from somebody who's, who's had to file bankruptcy a half dozen times. Um, that's not the way you run a business. And particularly on ship repair, and as you know this, but maybe for others, if you have a continuing resolution, you don't go in next year's budget. You have to rely on last year's budget. If that is last year budget and you've repaired the ship and it's out, you can't bring the next ship in for repair because that funding is baked into the next year's budget. And putting this industry, which is extraordinarily important in Hampton Roads and important not only in jobs but in terms of our national defense, through this yo-yo up and down, CR, stopgap measures, is fiscally irresponsible. It is irresponsible to our national security, and it is irresponsible to the men and women who do such a great job in ship repair. Senator, our next question is Bridget Kelly with WSET. Bridget? Hi, thank you so much for doing this. Um, so my question is, um, with Biden's term ending this year, What's your number one priority to get passed and, enact, and enacted for a new, uh, before a new president starts? And do you guys have anything in the works for this next session? Well, you know, I, I hope that it's not just one. Let me, let me go through uh, uh, a couple of items. One, I do think it's important, and this will be a bit of a leap, that we put some guardrails on artificial intelligence. There's going to be a new announcement on ChatGPT in terms of their next iteration. Technology is moving at lightning speed. Um, if we don't put some guardrails in place, uh, I think we will look back and regret it. I mentioned earlier about social media and the, uh, particularly the, the toll it's taken on, on young people in terms of mental health issues. I don't know any senator, Democrat or Republican, that wouldn't say, you know, we'd put some reasonable rules in place in 2014 or 2012 on social media platforms, we might not have the level of, of dysfunction that so many young people are having to grapple with today. AI, uh, one. Two, obviously, I should have said this at the beginning. We gotta make sure the government stays open and we don't shut anything down um, now or at the end of the year. Uh, two, I still think uh, there is room under a Biden administration to do more on housing supply. Uh, we have, you know, we need, you know, Affordable housing is a problem I hear everywhere in the Commonwealth, rural, urban, suburban, uh, and I've got a series of bills around housing reform um, that I think make sense. And I think there is broad bipartisan um, uh, consensus on that. You know, a, another priority I have is to make sure that we continue to monitor and, and, and stay ahead of China in the technology race. Um, you know, our national security is no longer ships and guns and tanks alone, it's telecom, it's bio. An area that I'm spending a lot of time on is small modular nukes at this point. You know, if we're going to have these data centers around the country that are going to suck up enormous amounts of power, we've got to have a carbon-free long-term solution for that. And we could actually get, this is less legislation, but what I'm trying to push, I just had a meeting on this earlier today, um, on trying to get some announcements from, the, from our utilities and the private sector, these big tech companies need to be putting money into the pot uh, to, uh, to make sure their power needs are not being borne by the ratepayers in Virginia or around the country. So, you know, I've got a series of others, but why don't I start with, you know, with AI, keep the government open, you know, look at a, an issue on housing, and let's see if we can move to a, a, a broader-based uh, energy supply. And I think nuclear power, particularly in these small modular reactors, which are the next generation, uh, we, we could see some of that done again before the end of the year. Senator, we have time for one final question from Andrew Shearer with WFPR. Yes, thank you very much for, for taking my question. Um, I, Senator, I, I'm interested in your thoughts on the Save AM Radio Act, uh, and specifically with, with the bipartisan support it seems to have in both chambers, why it hasn't been yet brought to a vote on the floor, and, and what do you think will help get it to there, because I know there's some, some time sensitivity to this before Congress checks out the end of December. Well, Andrew, that, that's a fair question. I, you know, I know a little bit about the top line on you know, saving AM radio. Uh, I don't have all of the details, uh, and rather than me filibuster on this, 
let me try to um, uh, let me try to get some facts and, and get back to you directly. I should quickly add, um, you know, the number of bills that get passed by the House or get passed by the Senate, sometimes with overwhelming margins, like the Kids Online Safety Act, and then the other body doesn't take it up, is, is kind of crazy to me. I, I do think one of the reforms that ought to be at least looked at, if a, if a bill gets you know, a certain percentage of, of, of support, um, and there is a, actually a House process on this, or enough bipartisan support, you know, we ought to be held a little more accountable to make sure they actually get an up or down vote in the, the body that's not taking it up. But uh, on the AM Act, I will get back to you. It does, it does tie a little bit in, and I, I won't go down this rabbit hole, but you know, about spectrum and how we make sure there is enough spectrum going forward. Uh, but let me get you some specifics on that. This is a subject I know too much about broadly, but not enough about specifically to, to give you a fulsome answer right now. Senator, that was our final question. Thank you so much, everybody.